Considered as a uh, straightforward extension of map estimation, right? So uh, basically, how can I how can I construct a one class approximation? We use Taylor expansion, second order Taylor expansion. First, uh, we find out the uh, we find out the map estimation of your log drawn probability, right? and then we expand your log drawn probability at the map estimation using second order Taylor approximation. And a fancy, uh, a fancy property is that for any continuous uh, twice differentiable uh, objective function, as long as Hessian is continuous well, for any local maximum, uh, is that Hessian is a uh, uh, semi negative definite. We have shown, we have given a rigorous proof in the last lecture, right? If you want to review it, uh, you can look at the video or you find out. Will open any optimization book. It's basically an optimization theory. Uh, that means we can you we can take a negative uh, in front of it, so it's positive. It's positive and definite. Then we can use the inverse to construct our Gaussian approximation. So basically, in our Laplace approximation, we're gonna first find out the map estimation um, of your law of probability. Then we calculate. This will serve as the uh, uh, mean of your Laplace. Approximation, and then you calculate the uh, negative Hessian of the log drawn probability at uh, your map estimation. It is guaranteed to be a um, semi-positive definite. So you can use this inverse as our covariance 
uh, of the approximation. And that's it. So, um, so that's the whole idea. Uh, so pretty straightforward. And uh, uh, and now uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll look at one detailed example. It's about Bayesian uh, this regression, right? So um, previously we have done how to do the map estimation with Bayesian or just regression, uh, uh, particularly the uh, Newton Robson's method, right? So I guess no one is uh, uh, no one feels strange to compute the hash matrix, whatever, right? So <coughs> Um, suppose we're you know, given a data set, I mean training data set, which consists of the uh, feature vector Bn and the label Tn. So Bn um, is kind of nonlinear basis functions, right? You first perform some feature transformation to obtain the transform feature vector uh, to recover some nonlinear model of power. If you do not want that, you can directly use the accent as fit. Right? And uh, suppose we have a like big n examples, right? Then we can construct a drawn probability like this way. Right? So first, we're going to assign a prior distribution over the feature weight vector, which is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Everyone should be familiar with this, right? So the prior mean will be M0, and prior covariance matrix is S0. Right? And then given the prior, we assemble the uh, observed binary labels for each, uh, for each uh, uh, input. Right? So the likelihood will be a product where each um, term in the product will be a Bernoulli likelihood. Right? So Tn, is, remember Tn, Tn here is binary, right? so either 0 or 1. So the probability of nth example taking 1 is denoted by Yn. So Yn is a sigma function of the inner product between the mean vector and the feature vector. That's our basic for this regression. Right? So, if you want to compute the posterior distribution of the uh, weak vector W given the observed uh, labels T, of course, and also the input X, right? And we, we can we design a matrix here, right? We just ignore it. So, it will be proportional to the prior multiplying with the likelihood, right? So, the prior will be a Gaussian, right? The Gaussian and multiplying with a bunch of like sigma. So remember the sigma looks like something something like this, right? This is a very um, very unfriendly. So that means if you multiply them together, you won't be able to find an uh, analytical form to normalize to calculate the posterior distribution. And how can we do that? If you still want to compute posterior, posterior distribution, we can try to uh, use the Laplace approximation. We're going to construct a Gaussian, uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution to approximate this uh, posterior, true posterior distribution. Right? So we just follow the uh, recipe. Right? So first, we're going to take a logarithm of the uh, drawn probability. So this term, this negative projected term, is the log prior, right? And uh, the second term, the summation, where each summon is a log for no likelihood. Is a uh, log data likelihood, right? And then you just uh, uh, maximize this likelihood. Suppose you end up with your map, map estimation, which which is denoted by W map, right? So we can further compute the hash matrix of this uh, log drawn probability and then take negative sign. So it turns out that I believe everybody has done that before, right? In your homework. Okay. So it turns out that the hashing uh, has nothing to do with W. It says this is a prior covariance, inverse of prior, prior covariance, right? This is a summation over all the training examples, and y, yn times 1 minus yn times, uh, oh, sorry, it's not, it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with W, sorry. So because yn is a uh, more than W transpose by n. Okay. It's not constant. Right? So, anyway, it's, a, it's a, such kind of form, right? So, when you compute this negative Hessian, you're going to evaluate the Hessian at the map transformation. Then you can use. Sorry. Now, with your 
coerce matrix for your Gaussian approximation. That's it. So if you happen to develop a, a new Robson method to maximize your the estimate, your Bayesian log logistic regression model, you can immediately obtain your Laplace approximation, right? Just reduce everything you have a, you have calculated during optimization. So now with this uh, approximate posterior distribution of the weight factor in hand, let's see what, what can we do, right? Um, want to compute a predictive distribution given a new input fit. How can I do that? So what, what is predictive? So suppose our training data is like T, T is our training labels, right? I put an arrow to indicate this vector. Consists of the bundle labels for like N uh, examples and uh, and also this uh, big bar is the uh, training inputs, right? So <clears throat> now suppose I have a, a new input phi. For problems I use Y star with that, all right? So their label is T star. So the predict distribution will be the probability, I mean the distribution of your label T star given the training data and uh, training input oil. This is called predictive distribution, right? Because we're gonna average, we're gonna average all, all the possible weights. That's why it's called predictive distribution. How do we compute this? Uh, conceptually, how do we compute the predictive distribution? So actually, we need to involve the posterior distribution of your model parameters, namely W, right? And w. So <coughs> you can consider predictive distribution as a marginal distribution of uh, T star and V vector W given test input T star and uh, training data the big Y and the training labels, right? You just marginalize this strong distribution on W. So this one further equals to uh, first Given W, how are you going to predict T star, given V star, right? So this is a logistic like. So T star, T star. This likelihood is Bernoulli likelihood, and the probability is parameterized by the logistic function. Right? And then the posterior distribution of W, given training input and training output, right? So how we decompose the, the strong distribution into the predict, into the posterior distribution of your model parameters. And the likelihood, given your model parameters, are going to predict the label, right? So now we just uh, integrate part of W. Why? Because doing this, we can consider all kinds of W and uh, integrate all possible outcomes we can divide our posterior distribution. In this way, we can obtain a more robust prediction results. And that's why predictive distribution is more favorable, at least uh, in theory, right? So now we know that the true or exact posterior distribution won't be feasible to compute. But now we have a Laplace approximation. Right? We have a Laplace approximation here. Q 
to the output. So we can reduce, we can simply replace this full posterior by our proximal posterior. So I'm going to replace the true posterior with my approximate posterior. <coughs> now I do the phase normalization. I end up with my approximate predicted distribution, right? But the issue is still exists. 2W is a multivariate Johnson distribution, right? So W is better. So we're going to integrate, integrate on vector. And remember, this is still a sigma function. This is still a sigma activation function. So it's a like, friendly something like this. And this is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So this, this integration is still invisible compute. How can I address this problem? Seems like our work hasn't been done, right? We still need to address the problem. Unfortunately, we have a way to overcome this. So we can take a look at the probability of T star here in phase star and W. And <coughs> let us just consider the probability T star equals to 1. Right? This is a Bonoli actually. So I'm just going to consider like one special case like T equals to 1. And given phase star w, which is simply minus phase star times phase star, right? Something like this, right? So if we look at this inner product, and uh, because w is random variable, then phase star transpose w will be random variable as well, right? So we can denote this uh, scalar. This is a scalar, of course. This is an inner product, right? This is a scalar. So we can denote this scalar as another random variable. So that means our predicted distribution can be rewritten as a the conditional probability of t star equals 1 given a star, and then multiplying with the posterior distribution. A star, the marginalize of A star, right? We just do a variable transformation. Right? Previously, we just, okay, we want to consider, okay, your um, likelihood is conditional on this uh, vector, the feature with vector W. And I'm going to marginalize, I'm going to multiply with posterior distribution of W and then integrate out. That is infeasible, right? So now, I reparameterize this likelihood. I know, okay, this is just a, a, a determinant by this scalar A star. So now, if we want to compute the predicted distribution, we just need to compute the uh, posterior distribution of A star. And then multiply with this likelihood control or determined by A star, then do integration, right? What's the benefit? The benefit is that A star is a scalar, it's not a vector. Then my integration will be uh, much easier. So let's see. Uh, first, what is the posterior distribution of uh, A star? So according to our, our Laplace approximation, uh, the posterior distribution of W is approximate a multivariate Gaussian distribution, right? So A star is defined to be A star transpose W, right? So W follows multivariate Gaussian distribution. Then what is the distribution of the inner product between A star and W. A scalar Gaussian, right? So you have done a problem before. Your homework one and homework one forgot. Right? You are required to prove that for any linear transformation of a Gaussian random variable, you end up with another Gaussian random variable. 
So the mean, the mean is here. It's just the, the mean of your posterior distribution of W in the product with uh, phase star rate. And the variance is uh, phase star transpose and the uh, covariance of your posterior distribution of W and phi. So this is scalar. This is scalar. So now I have a, this is very easy to compute uh, the posterior distribution, which is a proximal posterior distribution. This is another scalar Gaussian. So let me denote it by mu star and v star. So remember this one, the likelihood given x star is still a logistic likelihood, which is a 1 plus e to the minus v star. Okay. So we're going to multiply with this logistic function and a scalar Gaussian, and we're going to integrate our v star, right? <coughs> Everyone is comfortable. So this is this is still invisible. I have knowledge this is still invisible. You won't be able to find an analytical form. But this is just one dimensional integration. So basically, one dimensional integration wouldn't be considered as any problem right now because we can use numerical methods to do the numerical integration. This is called projection. So then we can use a. Uh, 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 numerical conjecture to approximate this intuition. And according to modern conjecture theory, this approximation uh, quality can be very high. The accuracy could be like below 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6, depends on how many nodes you want to choose and how many, yeah. How many of you have, have never heard of, about the numerical conjecture? Never heard of, heard of. Not, not here? I mean, it makes sense the way you describe it. Like I've heard of like approximate techniques like integration, but I've never heard the word quadrant. Sure. But numerical integration, is it more friendly? Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. So uh, so here I just briefly mentioned uh, what's the key idea on that. And uh, if your homework involves asks you to do that, I will give the sample code. So you can just uh, apply that. It's pretty um, it's pretty straightforward. So so what is numerical projection? Uh, numerical projection. So, uh, so for this case, is a is a is a is a uh, is a typical like a Gaussian Hermann projection, meaning that if I integrate some function with some Gaussian distribution, so usually I'm gonna use a um, particular way to do that integration is called Gaussian projection. So, <coughs> so basically, uh, what is numerical integration? So if I have a, an integral like this. So fx, you can consider it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, hard. And uh, this integration is not analytical. So the idea of projection is that I'm going to select a discrete set of uh, x values from the range, from the domain. Say I'm going to select, I'm going to select say, x1 to xn. So I approximate this integration as a weighted summation. Of the function evaluated at these positions. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of the numerical projection. But for different types of the integration form, you have different ways to select nodes. So how to select how to select nodes is uh, is uh, uh, really matters. You can you cannot do random selection. If you random selection, it won't it won't guarantee a high accuracy. So if If you have a, like a, uh, you are integrating your Gaussian uh, a function with a standard Gaussian distribution, something like this, right? So we can typically use the Gauss, Gauss projection, and uh, where I'm gonna select a nose at particular quantile points at the Gaussian distribution. So those points we call nodes, convergent nodes. So uh, you can select. Uh, Three nodes, five nodes, nine nodes, ten nodes, whatever. So typically, like nine nodes will be very, very common. So not necessarily this like a uniform nodes. So, and then those nodes are pre-selected. 
you won't need to derive it yourself. They're stored in, in like Python libraries or MATLAB libraries. You won't, you won't need to uh, memorize them. And the width is there. What you do is just call them to the width assumption. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the details about numerical projection, you can find out, you can search for the website. And also, there are numerous uh, examples about how to call um, like Python numpy numerical projection methods. And there, there are the variety of projection methods like Newton codes, whatever. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, very probably you are you you are gonna uh, be required to implement Laplace approximation for this logistic regression. You are you're gonna compute the predicted distribution. So I will I will use the sample code so you can just call it and use it. So that's all about Laplace approximation. So <clears throat> very straightforward, very simple. It's a um, natural extension of the map estimation, but uh, um, many cases is uh, uh, it's very useful. So um, what do you need to know? First, you need to know the general idea of Laplace approximation. You're going to construct a Gaussian um, distribution to approximate posterior distribution. And uh, you should be able to implement um, your Laplace approximation for some uh, for any uh, probabilistic models. So here I want to emphasize that um, uh, in practice, so remember our Laplace approximation is to compute the full coherence, right? the full coherence um, of theta. So theta, if theta is very high dimension, like 100, not 100. Uh, like uh, 10,000 dimensions. So you're going to compute a 10,000 by 10,000 coherence matrix. That will be very expensive. So uh, in practice, people will even um, aggressively approximate to be a diagonal hash. That means I'm not going to compute the full hash matrix. I'm just going to compute the second derivative of each element at the uh, map estimation. That's it. Any questions so far? Uh -huh. so in, the, in this uh, logistic regression example, where you use the log of like the log of the post posterior. Log of the drum to visit. No, no, I'm not. I'm not calculating the. I'm not uh, approximating the log of the drawing of the bit. I'm approximating the true posterior. So in this way, I mean, if you compute theta zero and a star, theta zero is the map estimation, right? And a is the negative passion. You just use this to construct a multivariate Gaussian distribution. That will be an approximation to the true posterior. And this, how is this uh, derived? We have shown before, right? So we start with this law, but we're doing pillar extension on this law drawn probability. Then we take exponential, trying to recover the original drawn probability. That's where we have this exponential term here. Any other question? Okay, sounds good. So <coughs> we have finished up the Laplace approximation. So now um, uh, we will switch to another topic. It's a big topic, uh, variational inference. It's actually a dominant uh, probabilistic inference method nowadays, <coughs> and uh, uh, nearly uh, everywhere. If you want to, if you use uh, probabilistic models, um, even many neural network, neural network models, they are using. They are essentially uh, based on the variational inference framework. So uh, this is all about to introduce the version inference framework. So um, 
First, I'm going to introduce what is EML. And a classical example for EML is Gaussian mixture model. So Gaussian mixture model uh, can be considered as a probabilistic version of k-mean sample. So everybody knows k right? So you use that to cluster data. So uh, Gaussian mixture model can be considered like how do I uh, formulate the k procedure in a probabilistic model. And then uh, the uh, common used uh, way to test the Gaussian, Gaussian mixture model is to do the EM algorithm rather than maximum likelihood estimation as to why we'll explain later. And then um, more important thing is that EM algorithm activates the structure of your law of model evidence. So you'll see the law of model, model evidence is decomposed as a summation of a lower bound and KL divergence. And that's the basis of the variation inference. And then we'll introduce the variation inference. Um, and we'll introduce a very important concept called variational evidence law of And we will see that actually we maximize the variational law of thumb is equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between your approximate posterior and true posterior. So you're going to select a different family of the approximate of variational posterior distribution uh, to find out the best trade off between your computational efficiency and approximation accuracy. Then we'll introduce the Second type of version inference, which is called local version inference. That heavily depends on the convex function. So uh, some kind of weird dual form of convex function we introduced at the very beginning of the semester will um, will take effect. And then we'll do, again we'll use logistic regression uh, as an example to show how to construct uh, how, how to carry out local version inference on that. And uh, then we'll introduce various conditions. And finally, we'll generalize the variational inference on graphic models. So this is called variational message passing. So first, Gaussian mixture model and EM algorithm. So um, this is a brief uh, uh, introduction on Gaussian mixture model. As I just mentioned, it's a probabilistic version of the Keynes clustering algorithm. So <clears throat> the clustering. Uh, wants to address that if you are given a set of data points and a designated cluster number k, then how do you group the data points into k clusters? This is a very fundamental problem in data mining uh, pattern recognition tasks, right? Because we want to look into a structure of data. Typically, we want to see the group structures. Right? Just uh, um, one application of k means. So suppose we want to uh, um, segment uh, the graphs, right? So uh, you can consider each pixels in your uh, figures or pictures uh, is kind of data point. I want to cluster them into uh, different clusters. So one cluster will represent a particular region of uh, of the of the of the figure of the of the picture, right? So the larger, so you can see the k equals to ten, k equals to three, k equals to two. So the larger the number of clusters you choose more regions you're going to partition the uh, pictures, right? If you choose k equals to 2, you can see that, okay, the whole the picture only uh, is segmented into two regions, right? Although these two regions uh, still sounds reasonable to me. So now we want to know how to use uh, probability modeling to represent the custom procedure. Namely, I want to use a sampling procedure to describe this clustering procedure. How can we do that? So suppose, again, suppose we're giving like 10 uh, big and data points and cluster number k. So here's the sampling procedure. For each particular data point n, I will first sample the cluster membership z n. Because we have a k, big k, um, clusters, right? So this cluster membership Z n is a uh, p by one one half vector. So one half vector is that uh, okay? Every element, uh, uh, only one element is one. All the other elements are zero. So this non-zero element corresponds to the cluster. The example belongs. To. So how do I sample this uh, cluster membership vector? Cost membership vector is essentially a categorical variable, right? 
So I'm going to sample it from a categorical distribution, which is parameterized by a probability vector pi. So probability vector pi consists of bk elements. Each element is between 0 to 1, representing the chance that uh, it belongs to a corresponding cluster. So the summation of these probabilities will be 1. Okay. This is a categorical distribution. And uh, again, if we uh, write down the uh, specific form of Zn, you can see it's essentially a k-dimensional vector where each element is Zn1 to Znk. But remember, this is a one-half uh, vector, meaning that only one element, so you see some Zn small k is 1, all the other elements must be 0. So keep this in mind. So once we have uh, sampled the cluster membership, we then sample the example, uh, sample the uh, uh, example axon from a cluster specific Gaussian distribution. So remember, axon could be a vector. So we we'll assume that for each cluster, we we'll associate with one particular Gaussian distribution with some specific mean and correct matrix. So if Xn is assigned to a particular uh, cluster. So assume Xn is sampled by the corresponding Gaussian distribution. So the mean is denoted by uk, and uh, the covariance matrix is denoted by sigma, sigma k. So intuitively, the mean of this uh, cluster specific Gaussian distribution represents the cluster center, right? And the covariance represents the software one. So it's not, I mean, it's not like a, a absolute or rigorous cluster Y or cluster diameter. Why? Because this is a, this is a distribution. Right? So it just means, okay, if your sample is within the covariance, within the standard division, it has high likelihood, right? But it still have a chance to sample outside your uh, standard division. This is possible. So that's why I call it soft Y. Uh -huh. So here, pi is something like prior, right? It's not prior. It's a prime term. Uh, that would be uh, updated. Yeah. yeah, we want to estimate it. Okay. Yeah, but this is just the sum model. We need to first uh, understand all the formulations. Then we'll consider how do we estimate those parameters. And then, uh, to consider like, like all kinds of... Uh -huh. How is this different? What? How is this different from the multi-cluster You mean, uh, what do you mean by multi-cluster? So you mean one point can belong to multiple clusters? Um, not the cluster, like the resistive equation you saw like multiple classes, things about the advantage. Um, I don't think it's, uh, here we, we don't have label. We don't have label. So this is not supervised learning. We only have like input vectors. X1 accent. We want to find out which group they are naturally um, stay together, right? It's not predicting um, whether it has label one or zero. There's no label here. Is everybody comfortable? So to consider like all possible clusters, we can write down this likelihood as a product of each Gaussian likelihood to the power of Znk. So remember, each Znk either is 1 or 0, right? So Zn here is one half vector. So there's only one Znk to be 1. Right? All the other elements are 0. Meaning that for this product, there was only one effective uh, Gaussian likelihood, right? All the other Gaussian likelihood because the uh, exponent is 0, so just 1. Everyone comfortable? So the natural representation of your uh, natural um, probabilistic formulation of a cluster and procedure. Right? I'm gonna sample. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, what's the procedure? I sample each data point according to some cluster specific Gaussian distribution. Right? So we can also use a graph model to give a more uh, succinct representation. Right? So Here's the plate. I'm going to repeat this procedure for big and big points. 
for each particular data point, I first sample the cluster membership Z and remember it's a one out vector, and parameterized by a probability vector, so this is a categorical distribution. Then given the Zn, I'm going to sample Xn according to the cluster specific Gaussian distribution. The cluster um, is determined by Zn. Right? So the parameters mu and sigma here consist of all the uh, you know the, the, the means of the cluster specific Gaussian distributions and coherences. So this is a, a graphical representation. So this is model formulation. Right? So now we are giving the data. The data is just those data points, and also the number of the number of the clusters. Our task is to estimate or infer the probability vector pi, as you just mentioned, right? And also the uh, cluster centers, namely the means of those cluster specific Gaussian distributions and the cluster wide, the coherence matrices for these cluster specific Gaussian distributions, and the posterior distribution that each point belongs to which cluster. Right? Is everybody comfortable with this uh, formulation? So now, uh, let us consider how, how, how are we uh, going to learn this Gaussian mixture model, how, how young is, how to ask these problems, right? So, uh, first, Strategy is to marginalize out the class membership Z and then do the maximum likelihood estimation. So if we marginalize out Z, what is the marginal distribution of X? It's just a measure of dust. You just wait. The Gaussian likelihood of uh, Xn under each cluster specific Gaussian by the probability that your point belongs to the corresponding cluster. Right? This is pretty straightforward. Like, if you want to modularize Zn, right, you just sum, sum over Zn. And uh, when Zn takes 1, Zn, Zn1 takes 1, then, then you can take pi k. And multiply normal distribution of Xn given mu1, sigma1, right? And then Zn takes, takes a 2, meaning Zn2 is 1. You add a pi 2 multiply with this gas, right? You just enumerate all possible of the uh, values Zn can take. You end up with this uh, summation. That's also why it's called Gaussian mixture, right? You see, this is a, this is a mixture of Gaussian. Weighted by a probability vector. And then I can write down the law of drawn probability. Okay. So the logarithm of the drawn probability is just summation of the logarithm of each um, uh, data selected group, each example selected group, which is log summation. Log summation of this weighted analysis, right? So <clears throat> remember, we have this probability vector pi key here. So I have to add actual constraints that. Each element in this uh, pi vector must be between 0 and 1, and their summation must be 1. This is a restriction for the uh, Gaussian, for the categorical distributions. So now just maximize this. Remember, to add this constraint, you have to uh, add a Lagrange multiplier, right? It seems it seems forward. And then given the parameters, namely the uh, probability vectors, the uh, uh, Cluster centers and cluster Y, we can calculate the posterior distribution of cluster membership in a straightforward way. That is, P of Zn given X is just a proportional to uh, the Gaussian likelihood for each cluster and the corresponding packing. Why? I'll leave it as, as an exercise for you because, um, but this is really, really important. But uh, I, I'll give you a hint. You can just consider the drawing for break of Z and, uh, and uh, the 
accent, right? So the posterior is actually proportional to the drawn probability. We're sure of that, right? So if you do the drawn probability, you say, okay, this is a this is actually P of Zn, and multiply it with P of X and Zn, right? P of Zn is what? It is this uh, by k, Zn k, right? And given Zn X is again this product, and uh, depends on which cluster it belongs to, right? So it's, it is take the power of Zn k. So if you do a normalization, you first can move to merge the product, right? So it's here, right? So you can see Znk is actually proportional to this pi k times this uh, normal distribution, right? So you can immediately normalize this to end up with this. Verify it by yourself. It's nothing special, just to apply the base rule to compute it. Well, this two step approach has a, a severe issue. I mean, this, this formula is still very useful. But I mean, we first integrate, integrate out Zn and then uh, uh, do the maximum likelihood estimation, will be problematic in practice. Why? I'll give you, here, I'll give you. Um, so for example, the industry. This is called singularity issue. So <clears throat> for simplicity, let, let us just assume each coerce, that is the cluster Y, is just a, a dark matrix sigma J square I. So again, imagine that I assume the cluster is kind of a circle. So each each direction they have like the same uh, dark it's often um, shows. So by doing that, let us consider when we do the optimization. Right? So uh, I'm going to optimize for, for each particular data point. I have this uh, summation of pi k and uh, xn given mu j and sigma gi. Right? This is some term in your um, log likelihood. If you integrate out to the class uh, membership variables, okay. to verify, to verify you can double check. Just here. So now, if oh sorry, if our mu j is getting closer and closer to a particular data point x and j, guess what will happen? Remember, you're you're doing a Gaussian distribution, right? So the Gaussian distributions look like this, right? So you have a like mu j here. So you have an axon here. So remember axon here is fixed. I'm gonna move mu j and also stretch or squeeze the y's to maximize the likelihood, right? So when where do I put mu j to maximize my likelihood? I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna move it to be closer and closer to X and right? When X and stays at the center of the cluster, namely mu j and X and overlaps, it will rise to maximum likelihood. At the same time, I can shrink the variance, right? If the variance becomes zero, zero, then your likelihood becomes infinity. So if you if you assume if uh, to, to, to give a closer look, like if you set mu j equals to xn, so your likelihood will be like this, Gaussian likelihood will be like this. Right? So the exponential term I see just mentioned is just one. So the remaining term will be this. 
So it's a two pi term, which is constant, then one over sigma g. Sigma g is very strange. So to continue maximize likelihood, I'm gonna just reduce sigma g, sigma g until it goes to, uh, it, it approaches the zero point. Then my likelihood is gonna increase to infinity. With that being said, I'm gonna find out the cluster which concentrate on this particular data point and with zero plus plus one. This is some local maximum. And very probably that if you run like the k-means, you have k clusters, it's probably that, that all of those k clusters will collapse on some particular point. All, all the other data points are outside these clusters. This is obviously not what we want, right? We want cluster examples, meaning that okay, we want the clusters to be big enough so each cluster will still be contain uh, quite a few number of data points. Right? We do not want cluster to be to be uh, collapsed on one particular data point and does not include any other data points. Right? So this is actually a, a kind of optimization issue. This is a, obviously some like valid local maximum, but it's not something you want. So how do we address this problem? How do we get rid of these polarity issues? The answer is that we won't. We're, we're not gonna like integrate or marginalize out the class memberships uh, uh, beforehand. We're gonna join and estimate all those parameters in class membership. This procedure is conducted through the so-called EML expectation and maximization algorithm. So we want to join and estimate the parameters which include the probability vector for the cluster memberships, cluster centers, cluster wide, and the posture of the cluster membership of each data point. So <clears throat> here I'm going to introduce the general framework for EML algorithm. Then We'll go back to uh, look at the uh, Gaussian mixture model and uh, apply the template to instantiate the EM algorithm Gaussian mixture model. So let us first step back a little bit, right? So consider a general case. Like we have a model governed by some parameter theta. So parameter theta means that, I can, okay, I do not care if uh, it's for posterior distribution. What I want theta is just some uh, um, point estimation. Do not care about that. And then in my probability model, I first have this parameter theta, and then I use this parameter theta to sample little, a little variable or several little variables z. And given the little variable z, I'm going to sample the observed random variables x. So my <coughs> joint probability or joint distribution of our model is p of x and z given this parameter theta. If you want to compute the marginal distribution of the observed data, that is p of x given theta, we have to marginalize out z, the later random variables, in the joint distribution. Right? So everybody agrees at this point, right? So here you can think of like what is theta and what are they for for for, for Gaussian mixture model. Theta will be the probability vectors pi and uh, cluster centers and cluster y for those cluster specific Gaussian distributions, right? And z will be the cluster memberships. But actually, we have we have we can find many correspondence to different uh, probability models. So now, let us look at logarithm of the marginal probability p of x given data. This is usually referred to as model evidence. We mentioned this before, right? When we introduced that, we'll explain how can we maximize the model evidence, which, which is called type 2 maximum, maximum like estimation, can avoid or be, right? Do you still remember? So the computation of evidence. Uh, is to take a logarithm and is to first marginalize out the joint distribution. So I have to do the integration first. 
then take the logarithm, right? And of course, this log sum, log integration, is very hard to compute. Right? You want to get rid of this. So, how can I do that? I'm gonna first, I'm gonna introduce an arbitrary distribution over the latent random variable z. So here we do not have uh, restrictions on q of z unless, uh, except that I want q z to be non-zero everywhere. Okay. And then I can divide inside this integration. I can divide the drawn distribution by this q z and then multiply this q z. This is totally good, right? Because q z q z here are canceled. But the benefit is that I can apply Jensen's equation. So what is Jensen's equation? We should mention it before, right? So basically, for a uh, uh, for a convex function, we have a logarithm of expectation of random variable is uh, bigger than or equal to expectation of a logarithm variable. But here, log is kind of a um, oh yeah, yeah. So this is called Jensen group. And here, the random variable is essentially this fraction. I can define uh, this one as, as y, right? Or fz. Or some function on z. Fun some function on z is still a random variable. And uh, the distribution of this random variable is with respect to qz, right? So I'm going to apply the Jensen stability. So the benefit is that I can move, I can switch the integration and the logarithm. So I can first calculate the logarithm of this fraction first, and then do the integration. In this way, we have obtained a lower bound of the model evidence. This is called the model evidence lower bound. And what variables determine the model evidence lower bound? First, the data, the model parameters, right? And second, what kind of uh, distribution of Q or Z you plug in to obtain this bound? Right? So essentially, this model evidence lower bound is a function of the model parameters and uh, some distribution of Z. Right? But remember, this is always a lower bound of your model evidence, namely log margin probability of x. So what's the gap between the true model evidence and this lower one? It turns out to be the KL divergence between the distribution you incorporate Q of z and the true posterior distribution Q of z given x and theta. So this is actually the fundamental um, observation a fundamental decomposition of the log evidence. And this is very easy to verify. Why? You just add them together to see what you can get, right? So <clears throat> if you add them together, so remember, they share a common factor Q of Z, right? So just as the two terms, two, ter two log terms inside the integration, right? Log plus log is log of product, right? So if you multiply terms in the log, Q of Z and Q of Z, Cancel. And you have like numerical P of x z given z, and denominator the posterior of z given x. So what is it? Base rule, what is it? Just P of x given z. You might combine this with this, is the joint, it's the joint, joint distribution. Right? And this has nothing to do with z, so you do the integral just. Um, just take it out, right? So I have, and you have the logarithm in front is this. So to verify, this is a, it's, it's, a, it's very it's very it's very straightforward to to verify this. But uh, this gives a very insightful um, result. So basically, um, my log evidence can be decomposed as summation of two terms. One term is a, a kind of lower bound. The lower bound determines is determined by the model parameters and uh, some third distribution over the literal variables. 
And the gap between the lower bound and the true model of this is a KL divergence. Remember, KL divergence measures the difference between the distribution of Z you copied it and the true posterior. And the KL divergence is always non negative. So now I'm going to use this decomposition to develop an optimization algorithm to maximize this model evidence. Maximize this model evidence is also called a type 2 maximal lightweight estimation, right? Because you're going to integrate out the random variables, you're going to only ask, you only optimize the hyperparameter. So uh, it turns out uh, 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 this can effectively avoid overfitting. It's kind of similar or consistent with the cross validation. Like if you still recall what I have mentioned before, right? So, <clears throat> how can we do that? The idea is uh, well, so, so, first, for abstract data, for abstract data uh, I'm going to take QZ to be the true posterior. If QZ takes a true posterior, what is the value of the lower bound? Yes, exactly right. Remember the gap between the bound, lower bound, and the true model evidence on the left hand side is the KR divergence, right? If, if I take Q of Z to be the true posterior, the KR divergence is zero, right? So I have no gap. Then your lower bound attach, attaches the true model evidence, right? So now, and then, remember, this, is a, this, this, is a, this lower bound is, has two parameters. One is the Q of Z, the other is the theta, right? So now, when I set Q of Z to be this true posterior <coughs> theta, I just fix it. And then I maximize this lower bound with respect to theta. This is totally doable, right? And then suppose we have a, a new uh, optimal theta, we denoted by theta nu. We must have like L theta nu Q star Z is bigger than or equal to L theta Q star Z, right? Because Q star Z is fixed, I'm just optimizing L with respect to theta. So I have a better lower bound than the previous one, right? And remember, here, given the key, uh, given the theta nu, Q star Z is not the true posterior of the model given theta nu. So that means the gap is still bigger than zero. That means this lower bound is not upper bounded by the law of model evidence uh, parameterized by theta. Does it make sense? So let me let me let me let me let me repeat again. So log p x theta is always no less than this lower bound, right? As long as theta is consistent, whatever QZ you choose, it is always bigger than or equal to this lower bound, right? So now I have a, a new setting of this theta, right? Theta new. Then we still have this uh, log mod evidence on the theta new bigger than or equal to this, right? But as to when this lower bound will be exactly the new mod evidence, we should choose QZ to be the true posterior given theta nu, right? If we use another posterior, say Q, Q star Z, which, which is computed uh, as a posterior Z of given X and theta, which is different from the true posterior right now, right? So we still have a gap. That means uh, the model evidence, uh, even theta nu, is still 
lower boundary by this uh, L, right? At the same time, we have, uh, remember, we optimize uh, L with this one. So we have uh, L theta nu Q star Z is uh, less than or equal to L theta Q star Z. At the beginning, remember, we choose Q star Z is the true posterior in the theta frame. So this is equivalent uh, to the all evidence when you take parameter to the theta. So now you can see, after doing this, we increase the model evidence. But we never touch the true model evidence, right? We never compute it. We just maximize the uh, evidence lower. But we can guarantee the increase or in other words, or not decrease of your model evidence. So the evidence lower bound acts like a bridge. You're going to operate on the model evidence, evidence lower bound and also this uh, augmented distribution to ensure the increase of the model evidence. That's the key idea of the EM algorithm. So the process, the step to compute Q of Z, which is the true posterior, given some particular uh, model parameter, is called E step, and the maximization procedure is called M step. So one iteration consists of E step and M step. So uh, here is the pseudocode for the EM algorithm. So you can choose an initial setting, uh, we denote it by CDM blue, right, or whatever CDM, right? So first, I'm going to assign theta O to this menu. Then in the E step, I will evaluate the true posterior, P of Z given X, under the current set of theta of as our QZ. Then I plug in the QZ into our model evidence lower bound and fix it. Then maximize model evidence lower bound with respect to theta to get the updated theta, which we call theta new. Then we'll finish one EM step. Now after finish one EM step, we guarantee that our model evidence uh, will increase. So we do it we do it repeatedly until some stopping criteria is met, like the difference between theta old and theta new is less than tolerance level or we reach some maximum number of iterations. So <clears throat> here is a visualization of your EM. Yeah, I think this will be uh, this will benefit uh, your understanding of this procedure. Right? So we start with theta O. We first take E step to find out a Q. Q of Z such that your lower bound touch the true bound levels. But now I fix the Q of Z. I optimize theta O to increase your lower bound. So now your, your lower bound increases, right? At the same time, because under this new setting of model parameters, your model evidence uh, is above your current lower bound, right? So now we can say, actually, your true model evidence is increased through this EM procedure. So next iteration, I'm going to update QZ here to make the lower bound to reach the true model evidence again, right? And then do this young step to climb to a higher bound. So let's do this alternatively. Updating, I'm going to uh, increase the model evidence uh, continuously until convergence or some stopping criteria is met. Any questions so far? So now let us apply this uh, uh, framework for the Gaussian mixture model. Right? So again, this is a Gaussian mixture model, and uh, we have uh, data variables to be the class membership. Right? For each data point, I'm going to first sample a one half vector class membership from parameterized by some uh, uh, probability vector. And then, given the class membership, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sample each data point according to the cluster specific Gaussian distribution. Right? So 
Here in the EM framework, our model parameters will include the cluster centers and cluster Y, which correspond to the means and covariance matrices for the cluster specific Gaussian distributions, and the probability vector right, uh, represents the probability that each data point belongs to each cluster. Right? So here is the drop probability. If you write down the full drop probability, so first it must uh, factorize over each data point, right? Because each data point is sample independent. And then I'm going to first sample the cluster membership according to the categorical distribution, right? And given cluster membership, I'm going to sample it according to the corresponding Gaussian distribution. So in the E step, the, the latent variables, as we mentioned, is the cluster membership, right? So the E step will be to uh, compute the current posterior distribution of the cluster membership given those model parameters. So how can we compute it? Same form, right? We just mentioned it. You just mentioned here, right? Given the parameters, how can we calculate the posterior of the cluster membership? You just weight the uh, Gauss likelihood by the corresponding uh, uh, probability that it belongs to the cluster, right? The same thing. Right? So then, I mean, for convenience, I'm just uh, denote for nth example, the probability it belongs to a case cluster by like gamma and k, right? So this is uh, just uh, 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 proportional to the Gaussian likelihood accident uh, in this cluster, uh, in this uh, cluster specific Gaussian distribution uh, multiplied with the uh, uh, probability that accident belongs to this cluster. Right? And then in the M step, I'm going to maximize the uh, Evidence rule one. Right? So the evidence rule one, here I just um, write it here. So it's an expectation of the log, which is fraction of the drawn probability divided by the QZ. Right? So here, because Z are discrete, so I'm going to use a uh, summation rather than the integral. Right, it's high level, they're essentially the same, right? But remember, Q of Z are fixed, right? So actually, this Q of Z are constant to us. We can throw it out in one reason. So we only need to uh, maximize the summation of QZ over this log drawn probability. Right? So here is the log drawn probability. Just take log. You just take the summation, uh, you just take logarithm and end up with a summation over N, summation over K, right? And so this is ZNK logarithm of pi K, ZNK logarithm of Gaussian line. And then you, you sum over QZ means that you take expectation of this. So essentially, you need to take expectation of each ZNK, which is gamma. Computed right? Compute from here. So the remaining thing is just uh, uh, maximize this uh, double summation. Right? And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to derive a, a gradient for this and solve the equation that gradient is zero. I think this is, uh, everybody can do that. Basic calculus, and you need to ensure that uh, a pi k summation of all pi k must be one. It must be between zero and one, and very probably you won't need to incorporate the negative constraint. You just need to incorporate the uh, uh, a Lagrange multiplier that summation of pi k must be one, and it's more than sufficient to solve all of this. It's pretty straightforward, and uh, you can see that actually uh, each um, update. Of the pi k nu is just a weighted uh, summation of uh, uh, not weighted from just a summation of each point belongs to k the cluster, right? And here it's just normalization because you, you, you need to sum over all the k. Right? It's very interesting. And uh, what is the cluster center? Cluster center is just the uh, average of each data point and multiply with its probability belong to. So NK here is the summation of the probability each data point belongs to K. 
So it's very, 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 uh, very bulky. And similarly, the cluster Y, the covariance matrix, is also average. So this, this is the auto product between your data point and the cluster center, weighted by the probability that Xm belongs to this particular cluster. I highly recommend you guys to, to write this because no matter you are willing or not, you have to implement this class mixture model on real data. So I have to implement this myself. So now let us look at this uh, updating formula. We found that we will never have any singular, singularity issues. Why? Because those are uh, fancy and nice weighted submission, right? It's very unlikely that all of your gamma and k will concentrate to be one or zero, right? If you, especially if you start with some random setting, like you random random set the uh, probability that each accent belongs to some particular cluster be zero one, zero zero point one, zero point two, whatever, right? So every time all those uh, probability uh, elements in a probability vector and also mean and coerce are weighted summation across all data points. So it's much, much less likely that you will concentrate on a particular data point. That's why in practice, uh, uh, people will never like, um, integrate all the class membership to maximize the estimation. EM algorithm is always the first choice for class mixture like models. So um, here's give a, just give a, an intuitive example showing how EM algorithm works uh, for the Gauss mixture model. Right? So here are data points. Those those uh, uh, those green dots are represent data points. Obviously, I mean human beings know okay there there must be two clusters, right? But at the beginning we have to like random initialize uh, the cluster center here and cluster center here. The blue circle and the and the, the, the right circle, right? And we have a uh, use some identity identity covariance matrix, identity matrix as a uh, covariance matrix, uh, and then uh, according to this uh, setting, at the beginning the uh, cluster membership vectors will be like this, right? So you can see the more closer uh, to the cluster center, the larger probability. Those dots we, uh, uh, belong to the corresponding cluster. Right? So in the edge, in the boundary, the posterior probability is kind of in between. Right? So you can see it's mixed the blue and the red. Right? And then we can carry out this uh, yeah, procedure. Right? After the first iteration, we can see the cluster position, the cluster center position for the two clusters, red and uh, red and uh, blue. It moves significantly. Also, the uh, um, the shape of the cluster, right? The covariance matrix changes a lot, right? So we can continue to do the uh, iterations. Uh, this is the two iterations. This is the five iterations. You can see that the clusters is more and more uh, converged to the true clusters. Right? So you can also see the change of the boundary of the uh, cluster memberships. So finally, after twenty iterations. Uh, uh, it close to the convergence, you see that, okay, this blue clusters converge here, blue, uh, red clusters converge here, blue clusters converge here. This is the right, right place you want. And also, as mentioned, this is just a soft line. It just represents, okay, uh, all the points inside is a circle, that is the uh, one standard division, has higher likelihood. But that's, that's not mean uh, at the other, uh, there's no points and the all side is the So, <clears throat> for practice, um, you can imagine like um, if your likelihood is not Gaussian likelihood, it's a Bonoli likelihood. I will derive a similar uh, update EM algorithm. Like if your x1 to xn, right? Each x1, xn. Just either zero or one. So I can follow the exact same procedure. I, 
I can follow first I it belongs to some cluster. And then given given a cluster membership, I'm gonna sample it from some particular cluster specific Bonoli distribution, right? So similarly, I can derive the YAM algorithm as well, right? It's interesting to see like I can I can partition the zero one points into different uh, clusters. And also, we can try to derive the EML algorithm for Bayesian linear regression. Uh, where does this come from? So, if we draw down, if we, if we draw the uh, graphing model, we have a sign of our distribution for the wind vector W, right? So, the prior distribution is determined by prior mean and prior covariance, right? And then, given the Given the W, I'm going to sample big data point action. So here, there is a plate. So given W, each accent, it will be sampled from the Gauss distribution. See? So it's not X, it's Y. So it's going to be uh, YN. Accent transpose W transpose uh, some uh, various right? So why not we use the M algorithm to jointly estimate this prior mean and prior covariance and also the noise variance, uh, noise, uh, noise, noise precision and the posterior distribution of the W. So we can apply this uh, YAM framework to do that as well. Any questions so far? Okay, that's all. Uh, we'll continue uh, this on um, Thursday. We'll talk about global learning.